What up, y'all? It is Comic Head 84 coming at you with a fresh new video. And, you know, I recently read through the Kingdom Come Absolute Edition. And I decided I wanted to put something together to show you guys some of my favorite and least favorite panels, particularly in scenes from the book. So let's get to it. You know, starting out with the whole Spectre and Norman McKay aspect to this book, this whole part of it didn't really do much for me, honestly. They're clearly in there as a plot device. You know, they don't really bring much to the table as far as I'm concerned. You know, I get why they're there to kind of move the plot along uh, and give us kind of like exposition along the way. But I feel like they could have done without it. And then towards the end, they try to make them relevant to the story. And uh, it felt kind of shoehorned in there. It didn't really make sense. Next, the diner. Uh, the diner from this book is cool, man. Uh, this panel in particular, there's a lot of cool stuff to go through and look at all the little Easter eggs and details throughout this diner. That's pretty awesome. Kind of makes me wish there was one of these bad boys in... In real life, I would definitely check that out. Next up, the the classic uh, Jesus Clark Kent picture scene. Uh, you know, there's definitely religious themes thrown in throughout this book. Um, they get a little heavy-handed at times. Uh, like, this image is not particularly subtle, where you got Clark Kent as a carpenter, uh, with a big two by four over his back, uh, clearly in a crucifixion pose. So, uh, a little on the nose, but I love that freaking panel. Next up, one of my favorite panels or pages, because this is a full page image of when Superman returns to the city after his little self imposed exile. As you saw from the last panel, you know, Superman is out the game. He's got a beard going, a white-haired beard going, ponytail, and he returns. Clean cut, classic suit, couple bad guys in tow. Uh, pretty awesome moment, and definitely a highlight for me. Batman. Batman and Friends. <laughs> uh, you know, just prior to this, you have the Clark Kent-Bruce Wayne exchange in the Batcave, which is cool in and of itself, uh, but the real highlight panel for me was, you know, during his chat with Superman, he references we, we are working on this, we are doing that, um, and when Superman leaves, you see who we is, and out from the shadows is, you know, the Blue Beetle, Black Canary, Green Arrow, Oliver Queen, and I just thought that was pretty, pretty smart, pretty well done, that in these times when everything has shit the Shit has hit the fan. Batman has put together an elite crew of humans, exceptional humans like himself, and that's who he trusts and rolls with. So I like that little bat squad that he has. As the Justice League is being introduced, we kind of check in and see what all these different heroes have been up to. We get brought up to speed with Hawkman, and then Green Lantern. Notice the the panel layout between these pages it, it all has the same layout um, which is pretty cool as they continue on to the flash introduction and man this flash page and the way they introduce him just like totally kills it in my opinion in fact it's so fire i'm gonna read the narration to this page and show you how well done it is so you got this image of Flash, who, by the way, at this point, is just like a red blur of speed. You know, I think that's interesting that a guy moving at this pace uh, over the extent of his life finally just becomes like a blur of energy. So I thought that was an interesting take on how to design his character. But the panel reads, In the time of Superman's absence, Keystone City has become a utopia. Protected by a gale force, once human. 
No one sees him. No one hears him. He runs a lonely race. But all who live here have felt his presence. He is everywhere at once. A guardian angel whose rights even the most harmless of wrongs, with lightning speed. He lives between the ticks of a second. He is the Flash. Damn! Is that fire or what? I really enjoyed that. Next up, while they're on this trend of introducing all our heroes, Aquaman, the king of Atlantis, um... Or is that Namor? I don't know. The under the underwater king, uh, Aquaman. They try to get some help from him. He declines, uh, and the way he does it is just perfect. Uh, I'll quote uh, his response as well, where when asking for help with what's going on in the city, he replies, You have hundreds of champions who protect a few land masses. I protect the other 70% of the world. And there is only one of me. I have responsibilities you cannot even dream of. Who? Well played, Aquaman. Next up, I just wanted to highlight some of the cool little character sightings that you get throughout the book. There's lots of that. There's tons of characters in here, new, old. And here's just a shot of Lobo. I just love the way that he designed Lobo. And also... For some reason, uh, Riff Raff from Rocky Horror Picture Show also makes an appearance in the book. Moving on to Lex Luthor. I really like the way that Alex Ross just designed Lex Luthor uh, in his older age. I like how he's put on a little weight. Kind of looks like uh, a real weathered curmudgeon type of businessman. Still a titan, though. Um, very well done. Just... Just love that image of Lex Luthor. And speaking of him, there was a line that stuck out to me when he's uh, joining forces with Bruce Wayne. Where he mentions to him, shit, if I knew that a common enemy would have brought us together, I would have invented one years ago. And I thought that was a cool insight into the way Lex Luthor's mind works. You know, real cunning. And you can tell by that statement that he really doesn't... I don't think he really hates these heroes. I think he actually respects them. And he's like envious of their power. So it's one of those things that, you know, if Superman and Batman were nice to him uh, and were willing to work alongside him, uh, he would probably love that. Uh, But he's not accepted by them. He doesn't have the same moral code. uh, So he just becomes resentful and bitter. But uh, yeah, just the cunning of Lex Luthor on display there. Really cool. At that same meeting, the Riddler. I just liked how the Riddler was used here. They kind of make him an annoying character. You know, the Riddler's finally... He's sitting at the big boy's table here. And he's just quipping, making little riddle jokes. And you can kind of see that Selena Kyle is is like embarrassed to have brought him. So I thought that was a funny use of, of the, the Riddler. Next up, the dead man part of this book. Uh, I mean, it was okay. I really liked the design, seeing him as as a skeleton form, really well done. Uh, but it was okay. I just this was of note to me because I noticed in uh, one of the additional segments of the Absolute Edition, Mark Wade kind of kind of raves about how this is his favorite part of the book, and he kind of like pats himself on the back of how brilliant it is, uh, and. Let's just say I'm, I wasn't as impressed with the dead man scenes uh, as as Mark Wade was. Next up, Orion. Superman goes to Apocalypse, the planet Apocalypse, to, to consult with Orion and look for some advice. Um, and it's really cool to see him, you know, in his older age, he kind of resembles his father, Darkseid, now at this point. And he drops a really cool quote about you know being in charge being the top dog and trying to uh, make things right in the world basically um, and having that weight on his head and he says Superman imagine the horror of learning that to the people of apocalypse liberty was every bit as paralyzing as fascism so that was some cool insight 
from Orion, almost showing the futility of you ain't going to change people, man. Um, and you can't win one way or the other in a lot of cases. People are people. Next up, I wanted to touch on the writing of Superman. Uh, I feel like in the beginning, it's kind of strong. I understand him putting himself in exile and, you know, why he's kind of done with everything. Um, but you would think that towards the, the middle and end of this book, you know, Stella should have got her groove back, man. He's he's in the hot seat. Shit is popping off and he just remains indecisive and always unsure of himself and unsure of what to do and the other heroes and characters like don't seem to respect him uh it's just a strange way to to handle superman especially this late in the game when the stakes are this high you would just assume that superman has a strong enough moral code moral compass to navigate the situation and at least come up with some course of action instead of constantly I don't know what to do, guys. If we do this, there's that consequence. If we do that, there's this. It's like, yeah, we get it. Choices are hard. Uh, but, you know, you're Superman, dude. Uh, so I didn't like the whole questioning himself Superman this late into the game. Now, while I'm critiquing the writing, believe it or not, I actually have a couple of gripes with the art of this book and the art of Alex Ross in general. Obviously, Alex Ross is a master. Um, on another level with uh, portraying superheroes and making them realistic. But one thing that you notice about an Alex Ross comic book, when you're not just looking at a cover image, but you're following a story through, is that it really makes you miss a good inker in a comic book. Images like this make me miss the classic layout of pencil artwork, ink on top of it, and then color that image. Because sometimes when you have big splash pages like this, there, in my opinion, is a lack of definition on what's going on. The color palette sometimes blends together a lot of bright colors. And you can kind of get lost in the image. Um, so that's one critique of Alex Ross's art of as be beautiful as it is, there are times where it falls a little short. Um, but on that note, it does make me wonder what Alex Ross pencil work would look like in the traditional sense of an inker coming in after him, putting that down on the page and it being colored, even digitally nowadays, um, what that would look like. Because, dude, Alex Ross's pencil game is strong. Um, his sketches are incredible, just as detailed, just as realistic as the paintbrush. And I'd be really curious to see that. I don't think that's ever been done. Um, and I think that's a missed opportunity. Now, in saying that, an image like this towards the end of the book, after the nuclear bomb drops, a full page spread like this reminds you why Alex, the boss, Ross, uh, really knows his stuff and, and can just put down amazing pages and amazing images. So... Uh, I had to cap I had to cap the Alex Ross critiques uh, session off with a, a beautiful image like that just to clarify that obviously Alex Ross is a complete beast. Next up is the the Shazam confrontation towards the end. My favorite part of that when they're duking it out and you have Shazam hitting Superman with the continuous Shazam lightning blasts. You get the Shazam boom, Shazam boom panels that it just really illustrates him beating Superman down with that. Uh, really well done. Really cool to see someone go toe to toe with Superman like that. Uh, <laughs> that was pretty hype. But then uh, two minutes later after the battle, it just seemed a little ridiculous when it's crunch time. You have nukes about to drop. Instead of Superman just handling the business, sacrificing himself if he needs to. You know, this goes back to the, I think, missing the mark writing for Superman at times. This is a good example of that. Of he grabs Billy Batson and he's like, Billy, you were the only one. 
that can make the decision of how this shit should go because you are half mortal, half hero kind of thing. Well, in principle, I get that. If five seconds ago he wasn't a fucking brainwashed maniac, clearly taken over by Lex Luthor, uh, trying to kill you. Um, it was just an interesting choice that Superman just figures, hey, if I, Billy, I'm just going to give you, I'm going to grab your face and give you a stern talking to and just trust that you didn't just send a lunatic, a brainwashed lunatic up into the sky to play with nukes. Uh, that was that was kind of strange to me. Finally, at the end here, in the epilogue of the book, we have the diner scene with Clark, Diana, and Bruce just chilling at a restaurant at that same diner as the as I mentioned in the beginning. Um, with just kind of a cool. What I liked about this was just the casual nature of the conversation. The whole book has been such high stakes. And it ends with just them hanging out in the restaurant, which kind of reminds me of like that pulp fiction restaurant where everyone was dressed as a different uh, like pop culture icon from the 50s. Uh, This diner is pretty reminiscent of that. But anyway, it was cool to see this scene. I thought it was brilliant when the Aquaman waiter pulls up and asks what they're drinking Wonder Woman hits him with water. I don't know if that's a a pun on Aquaman or that's just to imply that Wonder Woman just would make the the smartest choice when it comes to health. So she chooses water. Clark Kent orders milk, of course. And Batman Bruce Wayne just wants coffee. Keep it coming, Uh, which is just hilarious. And that just kind of reminds me of how old Bruce Wayne is at this point. And the fact that he must be like in his 80s. or something like that at this point. So you got to imagine for Bruce Wayne to even keep up with these uh, freaking godlike beings. Uh, he's like, bring on the coffee. The guy's in a fucking body cast, for Christ's sake. Uh, so yeah, he needs coffee to keep up. Okay, y'all, that's it. I just wanted to pass through the book, highlight some cool panels for you. Shit on a couple panels as well while I was at it. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you revisit Kingdom Come. It was a cool book, especially in that Absolute Edition. Uh, That's the way to read it, man. Uh, So if you haven't watched my review of my product review of the book, where I go through the pages, I show you the packaging, check that out. Like, comment, subscribe to the video, all that good stuff. Signing out. Peace.